Hello world. Welcome to the Intern Perspectives webinar series. I am Dr. Deborah Thompson and I am interviewing the social media intern for the third class of One Health Lessons interns. Welcome Christina Kren. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation and uh, greetings from Istanbul to all the people in the world. And greetings from the United States from to everybody in the world. I thought that it would be only fair to interview you since you've been interviewing so many other people <laughs> this year. Okay. And I wanted to first hear what your background is. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, indeed. Well, uh, as you said, my name is Christina Kren. I'm 24 years old. I am uh, originally from Macedonia, now North Macedonia. And I am currently living and studying in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I live in Istanbul already for three years and a half. I start like this year, my fourth year. Um, and I am also uh, studying uh, a bachelor, bachelor of French law at Sorbonne University in Paris. You said French law at yes. the Sorbonne? Okay, yes. very good. And so did you start with the Sorbonne? and then you went to Turkey or were you in Turkey and then added, how did that work? Um, well, to be honest, before starting my undergraduate degree, I was always passionate about archeology span and I wanted to be an archeologist. Then I wanted to be a cardiologist and I was, I was confused. I didn't know what to do. So I did as everybody did, just I uh, registered at the law school. And uh, I started at first stud uh, studying at Sorbonne. I was fascinated by the French met legal methodology, but I didn't uh, appreciate the French legal uh, the, the French educational system, not the legal one, the French educational system mainly, because um, I think that uh, there are not sufficient um, projects regarding uh, in, um, university exchange and programs and programs in English, I mean mainly, et cetera, et cetera. So I started definitely uh, learning at Sorbonne at first. And then I said, you know, like, I, 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 I really would like to study art history. And then I had a course named a legal history and the professor was at the same time a historian, but also a legal historian. And that, and he motivated me to start another bachelor degree. and. I don't know how I ended up in Istanbul. I definitely really, I don't know, but it, it was really spontaneous. And uh, since then, um, I started, when I came here, I started to learn Turkish because it was mandatory and it's a great language to learn. Then the next year I started with Arabic. And this year I started with Persian and Hebrew. And I must say that each time when I start to learn a new Semitic language or an Asian language, I feel like I'm at f in the first grade, like I'm starting all over again, because each time there is a new alphabet and you need to learn how to write and read. So it's fascinating. That's wonderful. And out of all of the languages, which is the hardest for you so far? Uh, definitely Arabic, because the pronunciation, it is even harder than French. Uh, Therefore, I'm struggling regarding Arabic, yes. Interesting. Interesting. And a lot of what you said reminds me of how I have been. And it seems like both you and I share the power of curiosity and the opportunity. Whenever we see an opportunity, we say yes to that opportunity, regardless of how much bandwidth we have. <laughs> so I believe that when we first met and I was considering you for the internship and we were doing the interview, you were saying, oh, I'm doing this internship and that internship and I'm doing three different degrees. And I'm like, oh, okay, so she sounds like she's, she's on the same trajectory <laughs> as what I've been on. And I think that's a really nice way to get into One Health because ultimately you have an appreciation for so many different sectors and disciplines and you have that history behind you uh, to just, get you to be able to speak with other people of various disciplines. So I thought that was incredible. I'm curious, do you remember much from the interview with the One Health well, Lessons internship? I remember, yes, I remember at first that I, I, I completely mixed up the time zones. It was every day. Um, I'm usually a very punctual person. And I said, oh my goodness, at that moment, I missed the first part of the interview. So how is it going to be like? So I was a little bit uh, scared. I must say, 
it, it was the first time that I was interviewed by a native English speaker, which was just you. And generally, I worked with people whose, uh, lang uh, whose English was a second language or a third language. Um, so I said, I said to myself, will I make English grammar mistakes? Will I forget my words? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That was my first, uh, uh, like, um, uh, my first um, feeling of fear. But after that, I when you started to speak and ask me other questions, I felt like I started to gain uh, my. Um, um, I started to gain all over again my um, the motivation, and uh, you were very encouraging. So uh, basically, even though I was late at the interview, you still uh, kept motivating me during the interview. In and and the best part of all of that it was, you know, to hear about your academic background. You're a musician, you're a veterinarian, and uh, you like traveling, and you speak French. And I think that we're sharing many many things in common. Like, um, for instance, I love Latin American music and Mexican music, it's fascinating. And I love speaking in Spanish too. Um, I think that the best question that you asked me was like, what motivated you to apply for this internship? And I just said, I just want, needed to learn something new out of my comfort zone, something that I didn't do until now. And here I am. I definitely needed to, to grow and to perhaps improve my English and thanks to you I think I, I improved a little bit my writing skills and my and especially I learned some tips and advice and pieces of advice of advice regarding rhetorics you know like avoiding the ums etc etc yes the rhetoric exactly yes that is a that is a big thing right for a lot of people because it's what we rely on <laughs> for pausing instead of saying have silence then you tend to fill it in with um and like and you know and so and certainly Toastmasters has helped with that as well. Yes. Now a big part of the internship is also leadership and I wanted to see what your personal perspective is on say from day one with the internship and your comfort level or skill set now have you growing pains are hard we all know that do you want to share a story or have anything that you think would benefit others to hear um regarding the internship mainly or some also some personal stuff yeah internship uh during the internship or is there any challenge that came about that you were not expecting and then did you well, from that experience or I don't want to put words in your mouth. Sure, sure. Um, well, I must say that at the beginning of the year, um, in March 30, on March 30, my grandfather passed away and, uh, um, um, unexpectedly and I felt like I was, um, I couldn't attend his funeral in Macedonia. So I, I remained in Istanbul. I couldn't travel because of COVID-19. And um, since then on, I said, what I need to um, what I, what I need to do to make my grandpa happy because he had many um, uh, he had hope for me and dreams and um, I said you know like I should make him spiritual I should make him happy spiritually even though he's not here physically because like this this will be an award for him uh, regarding uh, all the efforts that he has done for raising me up and for giving me the and for putting me on the right path of life. So I said I should do something positive. And since then on, I promised myself that I should work every day a little bit hard and just be a better person, be a better version of myself. And it was the moment when I started to do different internships. Then by the end of the year, uh, to, um, to suddenly, spontaneously find a call for internship that was published on the Facebook page of Miriam Avila because Miriam Avila was my contact on LinkedIn because I contacted her for translating the COVID-19 lessons in Macedonian. And that's how I knew about One Health. And wow. Wow. Okay, let me introduce, uh, interrupt you for a moment. I'm sorry about this, but just so that the viewers understand, Miriam was an intern from the previous class and she's 
originally from Mexico and now is living in the United States for her Masters of Public Health program. And she was a, she was helping as a language expansion intern slash North and South American and Central American uh, promotions intern. So she found you or you found her through LinkedIn, through social media. And that's how you got involved and that's how you heard about the, oh, very yes. nice. Um, I really knew about the call of internship before, two hours before the deadline. <laughs> I just, I just, you know, called my, my, uh, the people that I know that respond fast. I asked them for recommendation letters, if possible to be ready, like in one hour. So everyone like got engaged and uh, basically helped me out with all of this. And I could do it. I was typing my motivation letter and I was checking up my CVs. So I said, I, I will be ready. So I think I applied before the, like 30 minutes before the end. Deadline, the deadline, yeah. Yes. And then uh, two days late, later, you emailed me and I was like, you know, you say, I said, what, what is this about? I was thinking for two days before you emailed me, I said, what is this about One Health? We speak in my region about global health, public health. And then I read on the website, the connection between animal health, human health and environmental health. And I'm like, hmm. we studied this under the term ecology, mainly in fourth grade in my school curriculum when you were yes when i was a kid yes we studied it as in the subject called the college okay. uh, you know the importance of basically animal and, and environmental health the human health wasn't mentioned we studied that in biology so mm -hmm. i was saying like why human health is connected with animal and environmental health it was odd at first because i had never heard before and then i started to do the internship and started to learn much more. And then when I started to translate the lessons in Macedonian, I was like, yes, now I understand the origin of COVID-19 and plenty of people in my region who are sharing some conspiracy theories that the coronavirus was created in a laboratory somewhere in the world that it does not uh, come, um, that, is that, it, that it's not transmitted from animals to humans that that was uh, a fake theory or something I was like people definitely should be always curious to learn and definitely your lessons are incredible and I'm still reading them sometimes in Macedonia and I said how I would feel if I was 10 years old again and someone was teaching me this lesson with a totally different experience yeah yeah um certainly the reason why I made these lessons is because I wish I had them when I was a child it's what the world needs. So absolutely, it, it just happened. So um, great. And so you mentioned global health, public health, and in a recent intern meeting that we have with the whole worldwide team, there was somebody who came and spoke about global health and global health security. And you had some really good questions for her. And what I tried to bring to the table for the interns uh i try my best to get them to feel stronger as leaders be better communicators be able to really understand how to message uh, send the message of one health but then also give them new perspectives and action items things to actually work with and do and help them progress in, in their life and bring them to the next level and I hope that that is the case with you. I hope that you've had a fantastic time. Uh, I, I, I've been very happy to have you on the team and I'm grateful for it. Thank you so much for this opportunity to interview you. And if you want to interview me in return, you are welcome to do so. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this incredible opportunity. And I really, I think that uh, like I grew up for 10 years, uh, in this uh, period of few weeks of a few weeks because maybe what why, what I was learning at the age of 15 I understand it better now because we just at that age we're just you know th trying to memorize some concepts some theories but we forget them after that but now 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 I definitely think that what I learned at the age of 15 I understood it now thanks to you thank you for that my pleasure thank you Hello. 
Hello everyone, we are back now and now it's my turn to interview Deborah Thompson, Dr. Deborah Thompson from the United States of America. Hello, Dr. Thompson, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Christina. Thank you for uh, asking me whatever questions are coming my way. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> but... um, first, let's talk a little bit about your academic background, but before you start your bachelor degrees, how, you know, you are, you're having a passion for music and at the same time you are uh, passionate also about biology, veterinary, um, about animal health and un environmental health. So what motivated you also to pursue two bachelor's degree at the same time and in two different countries, Canada and United States, the United States? Ah, so, and I will answer everything honestly, okay? I'm not going to beat around the bush for any of these questions. My, my two different bachelor's degrees happened both in Montreal in Canada at McGill University. I, uh, so I started music when I was three years old. And if your last name is Thompson, it means you're going to be a musician. That's just how it worked in my family. And then I added flute as my second instrument when I was six years old. And then around when I was nine, 10, that's when I thought, okay, two instruments is too much. I'll just give up piano. But I, through various steps in my childhood, I realized that keeping music uh, going was a way for me to see the world. So, throughout my childhood I was doing a lot of I was playing a lot in in secondary school I was doing an hour and a half before school and then an hour and a half after school and then I was doing track and and of course homework and such so I was doing at least three hours each day plus if I had rehearsals for ensembles long story short I did a lot of auditions I was in a lot of ensembles and some of them were able to tour in various areas of the world. So that's one of the earlier experiences I had of travel. It was through music. And my dad has a bachelor's of music. Both of my brothers have a bachelor's of music. So again, if your last name is Thompson, you're going to be a musician. You're going to be a musician. And uh, when I got to vet, uh, excuse me, when I got to my undergraduate school, uh, McGill University, I knew I did not want to go into music because I was starting to get burnt out already. Because at that point, I was playing a solid six hours a day. Um, but I also appreciated that I loved biology and I loved ecology. And I ended up going to McGill with a music, uh, starting off in the music school. And then my grades were good enough at the end of my first year to add on a second bachelor's degree in science. So I did two totally different, kind of like you, totally different, absolutely no overlap <laughs> of two bachelor's degrees in a course of five years. I finished music in four years and then, and then science in that fifth year. So I was taking 25 credits, 26 credits instead of the typical 12 to 13 credits. Um, and that's, that's the way I lived for <laughs> a solid five years in Montreal. I think excellent. that answers your question. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. It's, it is very inspirational to hear that, you know, even though you were still uh, willing to continue the musical tradition of your family, you still were there to fight for the realization of your own dreams. And uh, which was, I suppose, to be um, a renowned veterinary specialist and uh, um, also a public health specialist. Um, so my next question is, um, actually, I would like to ask you, when exactly did you start your veterinary career? At, at what age? And um, have you been just a, a, a um, a veterinary for cats and dogs or you were also um, uh, working uh, uh, I don't want to say with bunch of animals but of, uh, you were uh, perhaps giving uh, interventions for different types of animals. Right so 
I can't remember how old I was. I'd have to do a quick calculation of how old I was when I joined vet school, when I went to vet school, but I was older than the typical uh, first year vet student because I didn't get in the first year. Even though I had good grades, I did two totally different simultaneous bachelor's degrees. That wasn't enough for vet school. All right. And I am terrible at standardized tests. I hate standardized tests. Me and when I, yeah, and my brain does not work like that. And I realized that when I was quite young. But that doesn't mean that I don't have grit, right? I still have, uh, well, you know my work ethic. <laughs> for better or for worse, you know my work ethic. Of course. So, you know, my brain works in a different way. And I did not get into vet school. I asked them, how can I improve my application? And they said, it's the GREs. It's the graduate record exam. I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's the only thing. Like I had all the experience. It didn't matter. It was the GRE scores. So um, at that point, I was looking for work. And I was living up in Canada, up in Quebec. And I moved to Quebec City. And that's where I was teaching. In the year that I was waiting to go to vet school. So in retrospect, even though I cried a lot when I did not get into any veterinary school that first round, that first year, ultimately that year played a massive role in who I am today. So it's funny how that works. To finish up your, to answer your question, I have been trained as a veterinarian in every species minus minus this one. And I purposefully went to a school that did not track. And what that means is some veterinary schools have, uh, have students learn everything by the book, but have minimal exposure in clinical medicine with the animal itself. But I wanted to work with horses, cows, goat, sheep. I was president of the goat club at my vet school, uh, dogs and cats. I had snake patients, you know, I had everything. And that was instrumental in not only my happiness, because again, that's just how my brain works. I like to be curious. I like to explore and learn new things. Um, and two weeks before graduating from vet school, I got kicked by a cow. I know. And that cow's foot was this close to my head. Oh, no. And so I had to reevaluate what I wanted to do with my life. That because I, was, I wanted to go into mixed animal. And I loved the medicine. I loved working with these different species. But it was like, oof, what, what do I want to do? What do I want to risk for my, for my career, right? Absolutely. So at that point, I did an internship, uh, a small animal internship. And then from there, so I was working in a hospital with about 20 other veterinarians. And then from there, I moved to San Francisco in California and worked in, with cats and dogs because that's what's in the city, right? And then I, I've always been happy teaching. And so I took every possible opportunity teaching that I could. So I traveled abroad and taught student, uh, students who want to become veterinary students, uh, who were in high school or undergrad, but then also veterinary students. I taught all of, all of that block. Uh, I taught these students how to do physical exams on horses and cows and sheep and goats and, you know, elephants as well. So I have, uh, continued the teaching tradition even before the that's like clinical teaching so I enjoy teaching I don't know if you've noticed absolutely you're so courageous because you are a multitasking person and you can do various um, um, things at the same time you know sometimes some people uh, would like to become professors but at the end they realize that they are just really good for research but not for teaching and some people enjoy doing both however um, uh, you told me before that you heard about the notion of One Health uh, during your studies. And um, I want, I'm curious a little bit, uh, what is the background of the um, 
of your project that is named actually a One Health Lessons. I know that I understood now that it's related to your passion uh, for teaching, uh, actually. And at the same time, um, uh, did you first think that it could be a project for only for your region, for your city, or even for your country? And then suddenly, you know, you went internationally and you start, you know, to engage volunteers and interns like us to help you out in this project. And what motivated you to create especially One Health Lessons? What is the, the philosophy behind it? It needed to be done. So I did it. Uh, that's the long and short of it. When I first learned about One Health as a topic in veterinary school, I was already in my mid-20s. I was older than you. I know that for sure. But I, at the same time in veterinary school, so when in the United States, after four years of undergrad, I mean, typical four years of undergrad, then you do four years of vet school. And then if you want to specialize, you do an internship and then residency. So it's the same track as medical school students. And so when I was in veterinary school doing my four years, three out of those four years, my best friend was a medical student, a human medical student. So we were constantly studying together. I was teaching him about veterinary medicine. He was teaching me about human medicine. And then also my dad is a, my father is an emergency physician. So whenever I'm home, we talk shop. We talk about comparative medicine. Uh, oh, what did you see in the hospital today? And he tells me about, I don't know, an Addisonian crisis, which is this hormonal imbalance. I'm like, oh, I saw that last week in a dog. You know, that type of thing. So, um, so the idea of One Health when it comes to comparative medicine and such, that is, it is just born into me because of my experience. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, I'm really passionate with ecology. And I was thinking originally of becoming an ecologist. Um, but with One Health, I can work with ecologists. So One Health lessons, I created lessons about One Health several years ago. I started doing that several years ago because ultimately I needed to do something other than clinical medicine. And I wanted to get back into the classrooms and I wanted to make a difference for kids. And I heard that down the street at University of California at Berkeley, there's a community outreach program that brings scientists of various backgrounds from campus into underserved classrooms in the area. Now, I have no affiliation with UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. They were just happened to be down the street from me. So uh, what's interesting is that one day I was meeting with somebody from the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley because I wanted to meet with her about something. And then I saw, this is just, this is what I mean by say yes to every opportunity and follow your curiosity because this is how this actually happened. So after finishing up with her meeting, I was just wandering around the campus for a little bit. And then I saw a flyer that said, um, there's a meeting uh, that happened the night before that I thought would be really interesting because I saw how I could have some lessons about One Health be implemented in, in this. And so, I go to the office where I thought they would have uh, been the organizer and they said, no, you have to go to a cross campus. So I march across campus and I see a lot, of, a lot of people in really dressed up suits. And I saw that I had something about education. I was like, okay, I wonder what this is. So I'm dressed up because I was meeting with a professor. So I looked the part and I go up to, the organizer and I just say hi I would love to be a fly on the wall what is this what is this meeting about and he explained to me that it's a way it's a it was a very competitive process for participants to be there and they the participants were learning how to become professors at various universities around the country and so I'm like okay well I'll just sit back in the very far back be a fly on the wall just listen ask no questions you know just be present and lo and behold another person who did the exact same thing sat right next to me 
And we started talking during the breaks and he told me that he was doing this community outreach program with UC Berkeley, which I had already heard about through the grapevine. So I said, oh, that's incredible. And he was an environmental health scientist. I said, that's incredible. Who was your contact? Who, who, who do you recommend me speaking with? Because I have these lessons about One Health. Oh, what is One Health? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> so ultimately he gave me the name of the person. I contacted that person, I arranged a meeting a week after, and I wanted to come prepared. So I brought seven different lessons that were focused on One Health to the meeting. And when the person uh, who was speaking with me originally said, oh yeah, you know, we'll, we'll explore this idea later. I said, well, if you want to explore it now, here's, here's some information, here's some lessons. And he's like, what? <laughs> so it's ultimately when these types of things happen, it's where preparation meets opportunity. And sometimes you have to make that opportunity for yourself. Um, you are absolutely right, because I noticed that throughout my life experience, uh, some opportunities come at the same time, and you can't just let them go. You have to cope to manage both of them. And that happened with me uh, the last two years, the very same, similar lesson all, um, the very last two years. And I must say that sometimes it's challenging, but you grow up and you learn how to perhaps to, uh, to deal with life situations when sometimes you, you that helped me actually initially to say that I, uh, to me, help me to not plan anything in life. Just let the opportunity come and deal with it in that moment spontaneously without thinking about previous solutions. Because if we make the solutions or if we envisage the solutions beforehand, everything at the end, something will turn bad. Like, um, will um, change the scope of the imagination or about the projects you were having, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. And from that moment on, since two years ago, I just let everything go with the flow, you know, like they say in English, go with the flow. Um, I have one more question for you. Yes. Can I, can I ask a quick question for you? Sure, about, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure. Because I'm curious, what do your parents feel about you going with the flow? Um, well, I wasn't raised with my parents. I was raised with my grandparents, so I can perhaps say, well, my grandma is almost 60 years old, and uh, she says to me often, just she told me, oh, um, how is it possible you to speak um, many languages at the same time and at the same time listening to your lecture? Because sometimes I'm having a Zoom meeting, following some program, at the same time I have to follow a lecture at some university. So she told me how it's possible for you to have one earphone here and the another earphone of your laptop and hearing both at the same time. And I'm like, you just have to cope with that. And just, you know, because sometimes I do recordings and I just re-listen them again if I miss some information. My grandma personally thinks that I have too many products for my age because her generation was different than mine. But she's not discouraging me. She t she's telling me, just go ahead, just go, go. Because she helped me, she told me, you helped me or you uh, gave me the, um, the chance to travel much more in this life than I did before. So she's very curious about the projects and the decisions I'm taking. Luckily, she let me since the age of 10 to take my own proper decisions. Since that on, I take my decisions as she told me. You will make mistakes, but you have to assume what you're doing. And that gave me the sense of responsibility and something that unfortunately not many young people are having them today because it's, they're not having the sense of responsibility because someone didn't teach them, you know, how to have that. And uh, since that on, since that moment on, I'm like, you know, I remember always the words of my grandma, you have to assume what you do. And yeah. if you make a mistake, you have to say sorry. That. Yeah, assume responsibility for sure. Yeah, um, I asked that question because a lot of people don't understand this type of mindset. And it's fine if, if people don't understand it. And it's certainly something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable to be okay with change and to just be going with the flow. Yeah, um, and sometimes it is sometimes it might be difficult with the family members because my cousins will ask me, okay, what you're learning now? What, what is going to be your future profession? And I'm like, well, just wait and see. <laughs> yeah. Because I can't respond to them because they think differently than me. That's normal. 
Yeah. Well, everybody has their strengths, right? Sure. And Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so perhaps I have la one last question for you. Yeah, go for it. Um, where do you see One Health Lessons as a project in five years? Like, what would you like really to do? Like, already you, since May onwards, you have done so many great things, and there are more than 800 volunteers by now, right? Oh, eight. I don't know about that. I know at least six, but eight would be incredible. I'm not wow, sure. wow, wow, wow. All six, right. Eight. How's that? Yeah. And, uh, like, what, what are expectations for next year? And maybe what are expectations for the uh, next five years as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there were some weeks where every single day it was a different trajectory. Like we, 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 it was, it, so in, on May 1st, One Health Lessons really comprised of me and my friend, my friend being the social, uh, excuse me, the uh, software designer who developed the website. And even though he's a software developer, he's a One Health advocate. And I know that because he actually taught One Health lessons with me in classrooms in 2018. So I recruited him for that lesson. And after that, he's like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm on your team. So he developed the lesson. Uh, he customized it. He built it from scratch. And so that was the we in the One Health lessons. From there, my goodness, once, I, I think it took... Well, two weeks after I launched One Health Lessons, that's when I put out on social media if so there's anybody out there who's interested in translating. And I was hoping for two, three people. And instead, this is blown up because right now we have over 75 languages in the process of being translated. These lessons being translated into over 75 languages. And that happened seven months ago. Like the launch happened seven months ago and we're already at over 75 languages. Ultimately, my dream is to have every child on the planet to appreciate what One Health is and to have a One Health mindset. And with that, you change society. So in five years, honestly, I don't know if I should say in six months or in one year or in five years or in 10 years, because the trajectory of this growth has been so exponential. I don't know like <laughs> when it, where, where it will end up, right? Yeah, exactly. So I don't know what that timeline is, but I can tell you what the goal is. And the goal is really to have One Health education at the primary and secondary level and to have scientists, technologists, engineers, mathematics, artists, anybody from any background appreciate what One Health is and have the, when I say One Health mindset, I mean have them think of their next actions with the thought of what the consequences are five steps down the line. How is that going to affect our health? How is that going to affect my child's health, my grandchild's health, my great grandchild's health? You know, um, it's time for people to look outside of their bubble to talk amongst each other because certainly one person cannot do this. I'm so grateful for the hundreds of people who have, who have, you know, contributed to this global movement and I am just not going to stop until, until it's done, until everybody knows and appreciates what One Health is. Absolutely. You are, you are uh, right. And uh, you know, sometimes they say, I, if, if it wasn't for you, I will perhaps never hear about the notion of One Health. Really, and thank you for creating these incredible lessons. I say, even though these lessons are for the um, for the adults uh, above 18, and even though I might feel older than 18, being 24 now, but I say, you know, it, uh, age doesn't matter. You still learn at any age. And um, I would like really personal, personally to thank you for the opportunity given, and thank you for this interview as well. Yeah, of course. And I want to just raise one point for the 18 plus lesson for the adults. A lot of people think, oh, this will be perfect for my master's of public health students and my medical students and my veterinary students. And it's true as long as you know what you're getting. And so I just want to make, uh, give 30 seconds to this to explain it. So I designed these 18 plus adult lessons 
in a very simplistic way in order for adults to then know how to communicate the message of One Health to the next generation, to their children, to their grandchildren, um, to other community members who really don't have a science background. And that's the point. Some people say, oh, well, it's too simplistic for my medical students. Well, you have to simplify medicine in order to explain medicine properly. And so that's something that I want to make sure everybody's on the same page about because ultimately the world can get very complicated, but it just takes a little bit of creativity and open-mindedness to then. And courage as well. And encourage, yeah, encourage learning. Yep, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So thank you very much for this interview. You are a fantastic interviewer. <laughs> and I look forward to continuing working with you. Absolutely. Thank you very much and happy holidays to you. You too. Thanks.